All right. Uh, welcome so much to Life Ministry Facebook. Uh, my name is Benson Weru and I work with Life Ministry Kenya. So I, I want to ask us to start by a word of prayer. <laughs> it's a joy to reach to all of us who are working from home. Let me pray and then we are going to start with a word of prayer. I mean uh, to look at the word of God. Dear Father, we thank you this morning. What a joy it is to use technology to reach to your people. And Lord, we pray that your presence, your spirit will be here present with us. I pray that the sharing of your word will bring light to all who hear and that we shall all be encouraged. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, so welcome so much again. Uh, my name is Benson Wero, and it's a joy to connect with all of us from home who are watching uh, in different places. Uh, Life Ministry uh, Facebook Live is to help encourage as many of us who have been uh, who have been affected by this Corona Manenos <laughs> to encourage you to equip you for ministry skills and also to envision you for the Great Commission. So I know that uh, in one way or another, all of us have been affected by this coronavirus disease. Uh, the schools are closed, people are working from home. Some have been affected uh, because of job losses, businesses closed, pay cuts, Others are quarantined or in self-isolation, eh? maybe because they travel from uh, countries which are already affected or they have been in touch with people who are affected. And these circumstances are called adversities. Okay, so uh, my topic today is God's sovereignty during adversities. How can we notice the hand of God during times of adversities? So to start us off, uh, we are going to define what is an adversity. An adversity, uh, according to Oxford Dic Dictionary, is a difficult or unpleasant situation. Okay, things that cause suffering, sicknesses, death, you know, all these things cause pain and coronavirus is an adversity as we see it right now. And the big question that many people are wondering is, so where does adversity come from? Where did corona come from? Okay, so in my studies, I, I wrote three three possible um, sources of adversities and uh, adversities that come to people can result from bad choices, the choices that people make. So bad choices result in suffering and pain. And a good example is suppose uh, there is a speed limit showing that 80%, 80 kilometers per hour. Now if I to over speed and that results in accident then that is an adversity that results from bad choices i think a good example right now is uh, being in overcrowded places or uh, not sanitizing our hands if this leads to an infection then that is an adversity that is resulting from bad choices Okay, especially where it is intentional. Now, the Bible refers to our actions as sowing and reaping. All right, so that sometimes uh, uh, our actions are like seeds. When we sow, then we reap. When you read the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 7 to 8, eh? and I will invite us to look at that one. <clears throat> Galatians 
chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Now, the scripture says that do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to, to, to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. So from this passage, you see that sometimes adversity can result from bad choices. Another source of adversity is schemes of other men. The Bible is clear that Cain conspired to kill Abel, his brother. So in this case, the suffering that came to Abel was as a result of Cain's intentional plan to harm him. So an intentional plan to harm another person, normally it is referred to as a conspiracy. Okay, Conspiracies reveal how evil man's heart can become so that people cause harm to others. Now, some of you have watched some videos which suppose that coronavirus is a biological weapon. Eh? All these are conspiracies, and there are many other theories about the source of this COVID-19. Now, sometimes conspiracy theories are difficult to substantiate. However, whether real or perceived, they propagate fear, help, and a sense of domination. So that is the second source of adversities. Now, the third source of adversity is natural calamities. So these are not caused by man. They just happen just because our world is fallen. They include natural disasters like earthquakes, drought, tsunamis, floods, locusts. <laughs> Yeah, but nevertheless, all these adversities bring suffering and pain. Now, the good thing is that the Bible talks about all these three kinds of adversities. The Bible has something to say about all of them. So let us now turn to God's sovereignty. Now, by definition, sovereignty means absolute power or supreme authority, you know, absolute control someone when we say someone is sovereign we mean they have uncontestable right you know they can do all things the the a sovereign person he he or she is without external influence they are a final authority to themselves now it's only god who is sovereign so how does god's sovereignty play out during times of adversity so <clears throat> This attribute of God's sovereignty is, on, is seen since he is the creator. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He has absolute power. He has absolute authority. He has absolute control. He is not subject to anyone. And he is without external influence. That is our God. In the book of Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah goes ahead to, to tell the children of Israel about this attribute of God called his sovereignty. Let's read the Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 25. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 25 <clears throat> reveals the sovereignty of God. This is what the scripture says. To whom will you compare me or who is equal? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all this? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, no one, not, not one of them is missing. Okay, And that shows the sovereignty of God over his creation. He has great power and mighty strength now god is also sovereign over the actions of men so let's look at verse 22 it says that he sits enthroned above the circles of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers that is god 
He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and a, wh and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. So what Isaiah wanted to tell the children of Israel who are under the dominion of uh, the Babylonians is that even though the Babylonians were powerful people, God was sovereign over them. He is powerful. Even now, God is powerful. He is sovereign over the actions of men. So I want to draw three illustrations from the Bible of how God showed his sovereignty during adversity. And I will look at three stories from the Bible and I will narrate them. And the first one is the story of Moses. We know that during the time when Moses was born, Pharaoh, who was the king of Egypt, he, was, he had given a decree that all male children must die. He was acting as a sovereign. But the good thing we see is that during that time is when Moses was born and when his mother saw that this boy was a good boy, he did, she did not to kill him. Instead, at, after three months, he put the boy in River Nile and the boy ended up being brought up by the daughter of Pharaoh. So, God saved Moses by his sovereignty, okay? So we see the hand of God playing out during the time of adversity. Now, we know that eventually Moses saved the people of Israel from the land of Egypt. And this proved that God is sovereign. He is a sovereign God even during adversity. He is able to save even during times of adversity. The second story I want to draw our attention to is Joseph. So Joseph, the son of Jacob in the book of Genesis, we find that Joseph's brothers, they sold him to Egypt because of jealousy. They felt they conspired to destroy their brother because he was loved by their dad, Jacob. However, their conspiracy to destroy their brother resulted in the fulfillment of the purposes of God. That when Joseph was sold in Egypt, he eventually saved not only Egypt during the time of famine, but he also saved his family. And towards the end of his of the book of Genesis, we find Joseph saying to his brothers, you meant this for evil, but God turned it to good. That is in the book of Genesis 50 verse 20. Therefore, we see that even though men can conspire to do evil, God is able to turn that evil for good, for good. And lastly, the story that is the death of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus, he is the son of God. But then evil men conspired. And even though they did not find anything that warranted death in Jesus, they still handed him over to die. Now, sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, conspiracies or uh, the schemes of men they leave people feeling helpless and dominated. And right now there are some people who are feeling that if this adversity is caused by men, then they are more powerful than God. But let's read how Peter viewed this uh, death and resurrection of Jesus. When you read the book of Acts chapter 2 verses 23 and 24, this is what scripture says. Okay, so Peter is speaking. He said, Peter speaking about Jesus' crucifixion. So this man 
was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So according to Peter, the death of Jesus Christ was according to a set purpose and foreknowledge of God. All right? So it's very hard sometimes to see that God is working even when men are conspiring. All right? So um, when they killed Jesus, the Bible says that God raised him from the dead. He freed him from the agony of death because it was important for death to keep its hold on him. Later, when G again uh, Peter is arrested, I'd love you to see how, how he viewed the death of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets saying that this that his Christ would suffer and die so we see that human schemes play into the purposes of God all right and then um, finally there's a verse here in the book of Acts chapter 4 verse 28 it says that here the apostles were praying and they said they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. So what the Romans, the chief priests, Judas, all those who conspired against Jesus did, it is what God had decided beforehand should happen. So in this case, I want to encourage us that in all the three, in all the three examples that we have seen is that even adversity plays into the purposes of God. So let's see some three lessons that we can learn from this lesson of God's sovereignty during adversity. So one is that adversity can be occasioned by poor choices, as we have seen, other people, or even natural calamities. Second is that man is not sovereign. God is sovereign. He is the Lord and he does not trust with any man. And so that encourages us not to fear, not to fear men. And then thirdly is that adversity plays into the sovereign purposes of God. Sometimes we may not be able to tell clearly where this is heading to. When uh, people do not have a job, you don't have a salary, you're not able to do your business, your schooling has been interrupted. Some of us are, uh, you can see, some of us are international students. You had your plans, but then uh, they are all interrupted by adversity. Let's remember that God's sovereign purposes will still be fulfilled. Now, what should be our response in times of adversity? One is that we can have peace when we know that God is sovereign. For example, when you read Isaiah 3.10, Isaiah tells the children of Israel that tell the righteous, it shall be well with them. So the context of that verse is that God was going to judge the children of Israel using the Babylonians. However, Isaiah tells those who are walking in righteousness, tell them it shall be well with them. And I can tell you this day, the same words apply. Tell the righteous, if you're righteous, it shall be well with you. And we see that later in the book of Jeremiah 29, 11, God tells them, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, the plans for good. Again, this scripture was given to people who had been taken to captivity. 
so we can have peace as believers when we know the sovereignty of God. Secondly, is that we can forgive. We can forgive, especially when adversity is caused by other people on us. And that is how we see Joseph responding. He forgave his brothers. In fact, uh, he told them, do not count, do not fight among yourselves because what they had intended for evil, God turned it for good. Right? So, if we appreciate the, the, sovereignty of God to forgive the actions of men. Finally, uh, another way we can respond during times of adversity is that we can focus on our mission. Uh, in the verse that I earlier read in the book of Acts chapter 3 verse 17 and 18, this is what Peter says, Acts chapter 3 verse 17 and 18. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus, even Jesus. Okay. Um, so, during times of adversity, if we appreciate God's sovereignty, we can focus on the mission. Instead of being distracted and uh, uh, trying to revenge or anything like that, when we know God is sovereign, we are able to focus on our mission. And I wanted to focus on a word there in verse 19 says, repent then and turn to God. So these words of Peter, he is telling this group of Jews who had witnessed the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. And I want to finish on this note calling for at you who are watching today you may not have this relationship with god who is sovereign the only way we can know this god who is sovereign the only way we can have a relationship with him is through jesus christ there's no other way of coming to god we need to know that god loves us and that is evident uh, from Romans. We know that God demonstrated his love for us, that when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, secondly, we need to know that sin separates us from God so that we are not able to have a relationship with him. We may not experience that sovereign purpose he has for us. But thirdly, we need to know that Jesus' death was the price for our reconciliation okay he died on the cross and he rose again and that those who believe in him are reconciled to god those who believe in jesus they are reconciled to god scripture says that once we were god's enemies but through the death and resurrection of jesus christ we have been reconciled to him we are his friends all right so those who have been reconciled to God, they will experience God's purposes. They will enjoy the sovereignty of God even through times of adversity. And maybe by listening to this, you know personally that you may not have this relationship with God. I want to invite you to consider starting this relationship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you may want to pray with me. Okay, you may want to say after me, Lord Jesus, I need you and thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you to be my savior and Lord. I ask you to forgive my sins 
and give me eternal life. Make me the kind of person that you want me to be. Amen. Amen. And so for those of you who pray this prayer, you start a relationship with God in faith, you can experience God, his sovereignty, even during times of adversity. Now the promise is not that who believe in Christ, we will not face adversities. No, we will face them, but that we can have hope even at, during times of adversity that God is sovereign. He is working even behind the scenes. So um, I close it here. Thank you so much for watching. It's been a joy to share online. And in case you have some questions, we can interact some more online. May the Lord God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you.